few months ago, I purchased a 20-year-old Land Cruiser. I was in Australia, but the vehicle in South Africa. It's for my own use, in Africa, when I visit to come and explore. And now I'm here to rebuild this vehicle and turn it into an overland tourer. Just, just looking for telltales, because every, every time you look under a bonnet, there's a story. I'm Andrew Cynthia White. Join me as I share my passion for building four-wheel drive trucks and then traveling to the remotest parts of the world. Was modified. So these engines came into South Africa and then they fitted turbos to a lot of these models done by Alpine. There's a lot of telltale signs you'll see. And um, it's always a worry when they've done fitted a turbo to a motor that's non-standard. Some of the companies used to modify the pumps and do work on the pumps and you never really know what they've done. Uh, but the fact that they've taken it out is one of two things. Either it did damage to the motor and what you is also picking up is that the head has been off which is good because it means that they've actually had to do work on the engine. Fair enough, probably pulled the head off. Um, we won't know until it if, it if it had to get opened. So the telltale signs is to do a compression test, check that out, uh, monitor the oil usage, see how much oil it's using, what is it? Is it doing any heavy vaporizing through the oil filler that's coming up on the sump? And like this back window, it's glued in. This is Hubert on the left and Paul on the right. And they are doing the first assessment of my new Africa build, a 20-year-old Land Cruiser 105. So now I've got that line where I draw certain parts I use certain spots I will never use even if the customer stands on his head because he I will know. come back and then I must explain why my name is on the wall or not. When people are traveling <coughs> the hardest part they have is to find a workshop or someone who can help them that's reliable and going to do good work. I'm looking at their joint expertise to establish how to get this vehicle ready for long, remote overland travel. Your immediate prognosis, your immediate, what are you seeing? What have you seen in the last, what, two minutes this bond has been open? What are you seeing? I think this engine part has been butchered. Yeah, has it? Yeah. I can count the faults in five seconds. The radiator is shot, the electric fan is not right, no aircon belt, wrong manifold, uh, aircon radius bucket, there used to be an intercooler here that was taken out. So when we say the radiator and that's bugged, because mm. you find that when you look at it from a visual point, the little fins between the cooling, the cooling yes. channels, yes. they've all rotted away. away. If you touch them, they mm. just fall off. So now, actually, when you're looking at these fins and they just fall yes. away in your hand... Let's have a look. Okay. <clears throat> you can see now, oh, right. this, this can't actually re take away the cooling. Oh. I mean, those little, those little zigzag yeah. between the cooling channels yeah, no. are to absorb away the heat. Yes. Now with that, that problem, it's, fall, it's falling apart. <coughs> same on the radiator yeah. here. Yeah. Okay. So it's really important. The, the key um, life of this car, or one of the critical elements, is the cooling system. It's the one thing that lets people let yeah. people down. So either the fans aren't right. So this they put an electrical fan, probably because they were running a turbo at one stage. Eh? What do you think? And it was running too hot. Yeah, you I never think know, for, really. for some reason they they <laughs> thought that the viscous coupling was the problem. So they thought, let's put electrical, it's stronger, faster. But that's not usually the problem. I think the problem was the turbo that was overheating the engine. Mm -hmm. Actually, I think often what happens is people add another complexity to what's already good. And I often yeah. believe that, you know, Toyota built a really good vehicle with a lot of very good engineers and many years experience designing something that really works well or they wouldn't have their reputation. And then people come in and change a lot of that, like adding a turbo and stuff to give power in that. And we want to go away from that. We're trying to take a car like this and say, we want to build back in the reliability. So it's important when you're going through the car now and saying, what are the, what are the things we're finding and, and where would we spend our money? And what would we prioritize? Because that's key. And the cooling system has to be one of the highest priorities you're going to look at to get that right. Because short of that, you, you're actually going to have a knock-on effect of more problems going forward. This can all be undone and sorted. But you and I saw in the photographs 
that this was not standard. If we had known this a month ago, would we be here doing this or would we have walked away from the airport? Okay, so that's a really, really good question because quite often when you don't look deep enough in a car, you can't strip everything before when you come to look at it. It's like buying a house. You don't always know that there are cracks in the house. You don't know that the foundations have got subsidence. You know, and, and suddenly you find in a few months time a bit of rain like we're having now, which is great for Cape Town, but you find that these cracks appear. So we will uncover stuff which you wouldn't have known when you bought the car. Sure. But, but this we things. knew. This we knew. Nothing wrong with having an aftermarket radiator. From the photograph we couldn't see the, the fins. No, I mean it's terrible. But that's fine. Uh, and, and, uh, that's this, the, this radiator will, will come the, out. Yeah. And you wow, take take this really radiator and have a complete recall. Okay? It's terrible. Yeah, I know. I mean that's really bad. I was just fe feeling the uh, the aircon thing and that's also not very good. But so 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 take it like this, you said any vehicle we would take the radiator out. Any vehicle. Sure. And if it's got a plastic radiator top and bottom, we tend to take those out and leave them out. Um, you know, people like Terrain Tamer build a really good radiator. And if they made one for this car, we'd be fitting it because they make a really good quality. Uh, it's got a thick wall radiator, it's fusion welded, so it's a really good, strong radiator. Short of that, we take a radiator like this, which has been custom built for this vehicle, take it, strip it, put a new core in, and it's like a new radiator. The value of having these radiators is that you can repair them in the bush. If it leaks and cracks, you can take it out, you can find a little radiator shop somewhere, and the guy will be able to solder it back together. If it's a plastic top radiator, you won't be able to repair it unless they can give you the parts because you don't repair them, you replace. You yeah. replace the top tanks and seals and stuff. So that's what we want for Expedition. Um, you'd want to try and go back to Viscous Fan because you want to take out all the potential problems. The aircon's not working, but we're not surprised when we look well, at no it. There's no belt. There's no belt. Is it? And we probably get uncovered more stuff with that. Yeah. Yes. Did they take the belt off because it was generating too much extra draw for drag. engine power or was, it was there a problem? A, or was this the bearings in the compressor gone and was making a hell of a noise or... And they're nice to have. Air no, con. I want an aircon, thanks. <laughs> okay, not I a fan of aircon. Air Sorry, I want an aircon. <laughs> okay. Uh, we can buy you that small one on the back. No, I want this one to work, please. <laughs> we'll take this van and put it in the car. <laughs> So what Paula and Hubert are going to do now is going to go through the engine and make a list of things that um, firstly they are going to replace and secondly they're going to investigate replacing and uh, this will tell the story of the, the engine and its components. I hope it has a happy ending. It will always have a happy ending. It just depends on the pain through it and what we're going to spend. I know. But I think it's what I mean. Day, <laughs> One telltale for me is you've just driven at 500 kilometers. Yes. And if you'd had anything really wrong with this car, um, you would have picked up a lot in the drive. Yes. So the uh, drive is very important when you drive a car. Like a difficult gear change, like um, a noise. The temperature that stayed hearing. absolutely constant. I was staring at that temperature gauge, so seeing that's, that's what would important. happen up the hills, yeah. and you know. And that's that's with a radiator that's not actually working properly. Bit dodgy, yes, yeah. and it was fine. Yeah, you know, and you've yeah. got a bull bar on here that's fine, but also what I what I don't like seeing is big spotlights in the front here. Yes. Especially on these sort of Absolutely. Cars. So, and we've worked on that before, how, how much that impacts mm. on the engines mm. overheating. <coughs> so the drive is actually a critical element. Mm. Most times when people are going to look uh, for a car, they don't really take it for a long enough drive. You know, they'll take it around the block or they'll get onto the highway and take it. It's not really long you enough to check a, lot. a car. Yeah. You, know, you actually need... What I say to folk, two things, if, if, if you haven't got someone like a Sneeman or, or maybe for my, myself to check the car, take it to Toyota, let them go through it because they have a certain amount of um, knowledge, experience, and they also have to have some responsibility. <coughs> right. You've asked them to check a car through. Yes. Okay. Let them put it through a check, do a um, compression test on the engine. That's going to tell you something. Again, we're just looking for <coughs> by going through the car and looking for leaks and looking for signs of wear on rubbers and things. Certain amounts of those we know we're going to change. We're going to change suspension bushes. We're going to change wheel bearings. We're going to do the brakes. I'm less worried about those components. 
but I do need to know when you break that um, she's not pulling violently to one side. Didn't pull. <clears throat> Didn't pull violently to one side, <coughs> but there is a warp disc because yeah. on light breaking, I can <coughs> feel the shutter. there's definitely a warp disc, oh, that's but fine. that's an easy thing to sort. Easy to fix, and that will be remedied when you change yeah. the brake part. Yeah. So, so the fact that you've had a good drive down here mm -hmm. has already built a lot of confidence for me. Yes. Um, the oil was a bit low when you picked it up, yes. so I always <coughs> <coughs> run the engine warm, check the oil first, see what the level is, see the condition of the oil. It was very black and <coughs> did not look but like it had been changed in a while, but so these things go black very quickly, so. They do, uh, they do, and it just depends on how often they've changed the oil. Some people only change it every 10,000, and that's way too long. You know, diesel's 5,000, and when you're on expedition, I look at the dipstick and I look at the color of the oil and, and at the dirtiness of the oil, if you want to put it like that, and I'm looking for contaminants like bad fuel. So if you pick up really bad fuel that's not been properly refined and you put it in your tank and you're, you've just changed your oil and then you look after a thousand kilometers and your dipsticks are already gone really black and the oil's starting to thicken up, it's showing that the oil's becoming contaminated with unburnt particles from, from the fuel where yeah, that's not okay. properly done. Uh, yes. So that's actually gonna start hampering the lubrication on the engine. So I'm looking, yeah. that dipstick is telling me a story. When I check it every day, I'm watching how dirty is it getting, how quickly is it getting, how thick is it getting on the dipstick. We know if you leave a diesel oil and you don't change it for a long, long time, the oil gets thicker and thicker and more gungy. In the old days, the high sulfur fuel used to really hamper the oil. That's why we started reducing the amount of kilometers you drove between oil changes. Mm -hmm. I found on Expedition that 5,000 is a very sweet spot for not only doing oil change, which is essential, often I change a fuel filter, and it's also a good chance to check through the car and see are there any problems that are starting to show a, mm. a sign. A brake fluid, clutch fluid, and a, you, you can actually see it's quite that's dirty. Very, okay. It is dirty, isn't it? yes. And that's, that's, that's just lack of maintenance. maintenance. Brake fluid is hydroscopic, it absorbs moisture from yes. the air, yes. so over time it degrades and if anyone's ever driven on a trip where they've actually had brake failure because they've overheated the brakes, which is scary to do and we go to a lot of extent to show people how to drive a heavy vehicle down mountain passes, but that's another time you'd bleed and flush the brakes, you know, to make sure that the brake fluid is in good condition. I use DOT4, I don't use fully synthetic brake fluid because Although the fully, fully synthetic would be better, you can't always get it. Okay. So with anything I'm using, I'm saying, can I get on my trip the same equivalent? So I stay away from synthetic, fully synthetic, where I can. Some vehicles you can't, but really on these older vehicles so that I can replace where I can get. Right. Okay. So air filter will tell us something, maybe not a lot. And and here again, so you've driven this, and if I take this, okay, yeah. so for me that's a classic example where people have either gone on expedition, and they've, it's like taking a, a mask over your mouth, getting it full of dust, and going on a run, and tell me how much you can breathe, and how easily you can breathe, you choked up, it's exactly the same to this car, it's choked up, you're putting the foot flat, by choking this, you're drawing more fuel through the engine, you're washing the oil off the pistons, you're creating more wear on your engine, unnecessary. Now that's with my hand, that's with hard blowing it out. Yeah. And you can imagine how choked up this is. Okay. Bad. It's really bad. Really this is throw away, don't is, use, sit on it. Uh, yeah, uh, uh, even even moving it like this is No, that's that's it's very really bad, bad actually. Okay, so that's, that's so so okay. Lucky you, it's a big one. The beauty about this system, the, the, this air filter cleaner box, mm. and I like these filters, it's almost like a cyclonic type yes. effect, okay? Yes. The value in this is that it stays cleaner for longer. Yes. You'll see some of the newer ones have got like a flat filter. <coughs> so it traps the, traps the dirt and air very efficiently. Like the V8. Like the V8. It's not nearly as good as this. No, because it, it gets dirty mm. really quickly. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, on something like this, I can blow it out. If I can't blow it out, I'll take it out. Normally at a fuel station, take the airline, blow it from the inside first, clean it out as much, wipe it out, put it back in, or I'll carry one spare. But the positive side of this, where, where you picked up and you found it had, was low on oil, 
Now you can actually see how something like this can relate to that and cause it. Okay, I'm not saying uh, that that lack of maintenance is, is any excuse. It's a, it's a poor excuse for looking after an engine. You know, you should maintain this. You should keep the oil topped up. But I'm trying to link the story of it. this. This has a knock-on effect of what can happen and other things you pick up, and that's what we look for. So the same, same here. When I'm looking here. When I'm buying a car, I'm looking inside here. Now this is nice and clean. Okay, there's no real residue in this. Got a bit of black. I expect that. That's fine. Uh, <clears throat> if this had white, white sort of uh, like a oil, frothy white oil in there, it looks like mayonnaise almost. You'd walk away from the car because that's straight away telling me there's a problem on the cooling system. That means that the water is getting into the cooling into the oil, into the oil. and it's causing that problem. So, so one of the telltales inside in the, in the cap here is, is there anything that's created in here? Is there any white residue, white yellowish residue? Oil and water don't like mixing, and that's what you're seeing when you see that. Yes, it's a grayish, also, it's a grayish pale. Well, it's like a, it's a, it's a yellowy gray cup, but, but yeah, it's, it's, you'll see it. You can see it from there. It's, it's more light than it is dark. Yes. Okay. You also pick it up on the dipstick. So before I'm doing anything, I want to say, okay, and if I see that, I walk away. Because right, right now, I know there's an expensive job on this. That means the cylinder head's coming off, did it damage the rings, how hot did it get? I don't want to risk it. So question now, when I took the vehicle immediately, I drove it for um, one and a half kilometers, pulled into a service station and checked the oil. And when I took that off, quite a bit of vapor was coming out of the crankcase. Yeah. Is that a tail sign? It seemed to be a, quite a lot of it. Now you've taken it off and there was none. Yeah. So is that so this, vapor this uh, here. an here's, indicator? Here's so this is another telltale here. Yeah. The, the vapor you're seeing is actually the pressure that comes up from the sump. Okay. And that normally escapes, it comes into the tappet cover and it comes out here. And that's got a kink in okay, it. And it's got a kink in it. So it's blocking All right, it. exactly. So now we've got to another thing. What you saw is a result of this. Okay. So not good. And also, if it's if it's too much, you can actually fit a, a catch can, which is which not a bad thing. Does with the, mayor, the, mayor, the, the, the newer version of the one actually, it's got a little yeah, catch can. Catch can actually, and, and the Terrain Tamer do a really nice catch can. I fit them to all the V8s, okay. and even to these older vehicles, not a bad thing because it does actually take that mist, that oil residue mist, and it reduces that from going back into the inlet manifold, caking that up. So, you know, part of what we want to check now is how dirty is this inlet manifold? Does this need to be cleaned out from all that residue? The fact that that's got a kink in it hasn't served you, but it's shown up in when you took that, that right. off. So you see how it actually starts okay. to make sense, okay. what you're seeing. Okay. If I was, if I was um, checking the car to see, is it breathing as they talk heavily? In other words, is there a very excessive uh, vapor, oil vapor, which is telling me that the, there's a bit of excessive crankcase pressure, pressure. Mm -hmm. and that's coming because there's, the rings are not sealing properly, and there's a bit of blow-by when the piston comes up, it's mm -hmm. pushing mm -hmm. pressure into the crankcase. Mm -hmm. So when you see that, that's also telling me a story. <coughs> and when I take the filth, the, that off while the engine's running, or I take this pipe off, and it's excessively pumping out a residue there, that's also going to tell me a story. Okay, so on the aircon itself, obviously the belt's missing, and we need to understand what's causing it. So before before we do anything, we'd have to put a belt on, uh, test and it, run it, yes. run it, check if there's any gas in. We've yes. got an aircon machine that would have to check all that and make sure that is there gas in. Before we're going to do any of that, though, we might as well change the aircon condenser because that needs to be changed. So we'll connect a machine to it, pull any gas up so it doesn't go into the environment. <coughs> And then start from there. Um, put the aircon condenser in. Take change anything else that could be a problem. This pulley here is quite often a, a problem, and it's yes, it was with my my 105. I had, yeah. I had to replace the bearing of that pulley. <laughs> yes, you can carry a spare bearing if I'm yes. correct. And it's a 6203 bearing. Right. Uh, the the challenge is that people often over tighten the belts. So belts right. belts go hard. Uh, it doesn't take long, too long for the belts to get hard, especially in this uh, ambient, hot ambient temperature. And when they start to squeal, instead of changing them for a slightly softer, more grippy belt, they just tighten, they just it. tighten it up. Yeah. And, and that then, puts then a the lot of strain goes. on bearings. Alternator as well, you know. And also on the alternator, you'll notice it's got twin belts. Yes. So these belts are actually a matched pair when you buy them from Toyota. Yes. So they are actually cut from the same sort of, they're not going to be uneven, one's not going to be tighter than the other. You want them to work almost in unison. 
So that's also important because that's where people also compromise. When you're buying aftermarket parts, you need to actually make sure that they match up as best can. And sometimes you're guessing. Uh, I was driving across America in a, in a Prada 90 series. The front um, lower ball joint collapsed on us. We were lucky we didn't have anything fatal or critical. I walked into a Toyota dealership at quarter to five uh, in Orange County. And the guy and I looked through his parts, because they don't do that model in the States, and I guessed that the FJ Cruiser runs a similar chassis. Hey, we picked yes. that off a okay. parts thing. Yes. The next morning at eight o'clock, he had the part in his hand and it was the right part. Okay. So very, very lucky, yeah. uh, amazing. I couldn't believe it. Yes, but you knew that FJ had such a similar chassis. I knew that it yeah, was a yeah, pretty yeah, good yeah. chance. I was just, they, just kind of like- But most people, many useful. people wouldn't know. They wouldn't know that, no. no. That was just lucky. Yeah. Um, so I, again, you know, when I'm looking here at pipes, I'm looking at the pipes, so this is the pipe for the power steering reservoir there. Now that's weeping. So it probably it's telling me that that pipe's probably gone very hard. <clears throat> Although it's got a hose clamp on, pipes get really hard and then actually you'll see at the edges of the pipe if we take it off, it's probably got cracks on it. So all the hoses on, on the actual vehicle, heater hoses, radiator hoses, power steering pipes, rubber hoses, we change. What I do like about the Terrain Tamer kits is that when you get a kit it's all the hoses everything is there everything there's one thing that these guys do very very well and it's something we're going to show a lot more of is that they tend to put everything you need and make it as easy as they can to fit it so if i'm fitting a clutch kit the spigot bearings in the kit um, the tool to align to align stuff's there if I'm fitting hoses, all the hoses I need are, are a kit. And this really makes it much easier than trying to order individual hoses. Whatever you do, you need to make sure that if the hose is, is old and we don't know the age of this hose, but for the price of that hose, change it. Critical part. It's a critical part. Take the, take the old one as a spare. Take the old one yes, as a spare. You know, a lot of old parts make good spares. Yes. You don't have to have new parts. Yes. I'm a firm believer, put the new parts in the car, make sure it's right, it's tested. You know the old parts, right? Because you've taken it off. And where possible, some of the old parts really are pretty good. And you may never use this radiator hose, but at least I know peace of mind I've got the new one on. There is a distinct cracking noise when moving in reverse. It's vital that we find out the cause before work begins. It's very difficult because the sound you hear will resonate through the car. But I think it's something, I think it's possibly a front CV joint. It's now time to get it on the lift. What will we find underneath? Has the drivetrain been butchered like the engine? Next week we'll continue our history lesson, revealing how this Land Cruiser has been treated, or mistreated, in its already long life. One thing about trucks in Africa, there's very little rust on them. Mm. You know, you don't get a lot of rust on the trucks, which is really good. She's all safe? 